All right, so for the interest of time, it's 30. Let's start. <laughs> as you might have noticed, and as Namrata has mentioned, we have an all-female panel today. <laughs> so, as you can see, the ladies are very happy about that. So, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm extremely honored to be part of this panel, and basically, this is the panel of our innovation challenge. Back in January 17th, we launched a program. We launched an innovation challenge. This is the creator over here. And the idea was to basically obtain proposals that aim to make supply chains greener, more resilient, and efficient. So the people that I have here beside me are actually our finalists and our two winners. So our session today will basically be presenting, they will be presenting their innovations. They'll be explaining what are the challenges that they had faced. And then we'll have a discussion with some other experts in the room, which are present also here. I'll present all of you in a, in a little bit. And the idea is just to have a discussion amongst all our, between all of us, and to then maybe have a brainstorming of what the next innovation challenge could be about. Because this time it was very general. It was about making it greener, more resilient and efficient, but perhaps there is a certain topic we would like to tackle for the 2026 innovation challenge. So just something to start thinking about. So now. I'm going to present to you our wonderful panelists for the day. First and foremost, well, no, first and foremost, no, I didn't present who I am. My name is Maria. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, hi, I'm Maria. <laughs> we, know, we know you, Maria. <laughs> okay, great. Everyone knows you. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and uh, I am a consultant at UNCTAD, at UN Trained and Development. I have Tadiwa Mutibura here with me. She is the winner of the Innovation Challenge. I have Christina Martin on my left, who is the Innovation Challenge private sector winner. I have Millie Ogden over here. She's a CEO of 3Link. She will explain everything she has to about her wonderful proposal. And on my left, I have Stephanie Som, who is a CEO, well, CEO I was gonna say, advisor in transport and climate for CUNA. And she will present a line, a What's the name? Line, 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 line. Lifelines. I always get that wrong. I'm so ashamed. <laughs> and of course, I have Pamela Ugas, our Economic Affairs Officer at UNCTAD, also UN Trade and Development mm -hmm. since we rebranded. And our wonderful experts for the day. We have Eranda Cotelawala, who is a CEO of uh, Solomon Ports Authority. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we also have Ines Nastali, who is Senior Maritime Data Expert and S &P at s and Global. And, well, Pamela Ugas, who will be our Trade Facilitation Expert for the day. So without further ado, I'll stop blabbing, and we'll start with our first presentation of the day by Millie Ogden. So, Millie, the floor is yours, and hopefully I'll find your slides on time. Hello, everyone. Well, Maria is finding my slides. I am um, sorry for sending it to her late. Um, I'd like to just uh, say a note of thank you um, to the government of Barbados uh, for hosting this forum. And thank you, UNCTAD, for providing our company the opportunity to share and build collaboration for our project. The five, um, I am from Vanuatu, and uh, we have many weaknesses, but we also have strengths. And I would like to uh, showcase today uh, a technology transfer uh, possibility. And uh, uh, I would like to say that um, the 5G um, telecommunication uh, for smart ports is very possible. Building the infrastructure itself, uh, the digital infrastructure is not expensive, but then the smart port itself, upgrading it is. Um, then there's also, it's very difficult for us to be able to um, utilize our port if uh, we don't ha address our energy constraint. And because we have seven active volcanoes, we have strengths. And we're able to develop the potential of geothermal. And our big dream is to be able to export that in a form of hydrogen. So that is in development. And we'll talk about the challenges and how we can innovate towards that. And of course, these are really long-term project, but the 5G smart port is uh, a project that we're able to implement within six months. And I'd like to share with you our experience because I understand that in developing countries, 
the ITU specifies that only one in 100 developing countries have 5G technology. So we'd very much like to have Anuatu to be number two. Um, but uh, even very developed countries, for example, Singapore, um, they're having challenges with having 5G in their waterway. So um, that uh, to address their bunker issue and also um, their seafarers um, um, uh, 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 particular matters. Um, uh, here's my presentation. I would like to uh, show you the disruptive portion of it, which is the 5G um, digital virtual core. And that is the part uh, that we're able to implement because uh, we're using our supplier, which is Starlink. And with their $1 billion investment plus, um, we're able to really leverage that to utilize uh, the 5G technology. I'm of the belief that technology is actually perishable, and so I have. Uh, I wish that we can be liberal in uh, dr uh, drawing that down and utilizing it. Um, Maria, I would like to show. Yes, there it is. Digitization, and uh, I also like to address a showy business model for our geothermal and green hydrogen, uh, because we are the few. We are a country that has the active volcano and geothermal potential, and we can supply that to our region. And uh, it addresses many SDG, climate action being a critical part for us. Um, and then we'll, 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 next slide, thank you. And this is our region. Um, we would like to very much be part of the equitable um, energy transition uh, where we are an active agent of innovation. And um, next is, um, I'll go to the slide with the virtual core. There we go, sorry, one more. There it is. So we're able to leverage, and this is uh, the disruptive technology that is available uh, for piloting uh, in any waterway as well. Uh, that is the exciting part. And so we're using um, AWS uh, as the cloud-based uh, virtual core, and we're using um, our other suppliers such as Dtcon and Mavernier. And the part that might be, uh, uh, um, we're also using Ericsson and, uh, in terms of equipment. And uh, the proprietary part is the open RAN uh, platform that allows us to scale and uh, segment uh, different private networks for smart ports. And this is not only in Vanuatu, but in other places as well. Um, I would like to conclude with my <laughs> my uh, hydrogen uh, geothermal project, um, so I can give space, uh, give time to the other panelists. Um, this is our uh, model for our 5G. It's uh, because we are able to utilize Starlink pricing. Uh, it really is accessible, affordable, and uh, this shows a, a positive cash flow uh, within one to two years. So we have a very high EBITDA. Very exciting. <laughs> next, uh, for telecommunication. Um, uh, next, so this is again uh, where we're saying that it actually costs more to upgrade a legacy 4G system. Uh, it costs more, it actually it's much cheaper to just leapfrog into a 5G system currently. And uh, this is the port in Vanuatu. In the Ligonville Center where I'm from, third generation, from Vanuatu, and we have the largest port in Santo. It is uh, geopolitically sensitive as well for many of the SIDS nation because of our access way. We have um, 800 miles of coastal uh, um, ma uh, mile uh, way, and uh, that is as big as uh, the size of California. So there's a lot that we can do, and we hope that we can be a potential hub for the region as well, and especially if we're able to have a play in the renewable energy sector. Yes. And so this is the open RAN, and it's very important also for the low latency in using uh, AI to manage uh, not only the energy, but also the ports. Go. And this is the timeline is very realistic in terms of year one implementation. It takes six months for us to be able to finish programming it, and then to, of course, to design it with the different port, there are only two ports in Vanuatu, 
um, and then to be able to roll that out uh, within a short period of time and to see its economic benefit um, that will really help with our agriculture export. And uh, we are asking for um, a consideration because we do face a lot of uh, climate impact our frequent catastrophic cyclones uh, put us at a great disadvantage. Our ports uh, get chipped and is not usable. Our networks come, uh, come down. So if we're able to implement this 5G smart port in Vanuatu, we're able to bounce back much faster. And the footprint for the 5G is actually a lot smaller. We don't need big towers. We could uh, hang, in, hang it in uh, um, more feasible places for, to rebuild the port immediately. And it is, um, it addresses, uh, it's, it's so critical for us because when we have a cyclone, we have humanitarian aid that needs to come in right away. And when our telecommunication is down, where it's very hard for us to coordinate that with our NDMO, our National, uh, our national Disaster uh, Office. Um, next. And this is our dream where we are asking uh, for uh, 10 million uh, to just not build the infrastructure, but to actually implement the entire smart port for our region. And there are other Pacific Island that are also watching and they would like to participate in this as well. And so the lessons learned from this uh, business model, we can be applied to them. And uh, with our geothermal potential, this is a very long run. It's a 10-year scope of what we can build, a 20 megawatt facility. Uh, with the technology that is available currently, I do feel we can lean in and build out our um, energy um, sovereign uh, capability much faster. So thank you so much for your time, and I'm uh, looking forward to talking about challenges. Next. Thank you so much, Millie. And uh, what a fantastic presentation, what can I say? And uh, we'll, con we'll continue now with uh, Stephanie Som, who is on her left over here presenting Lifelines. See, I got it right this time around. Um, so whenever you're ready, I'm going to start preparing the computer and you can go ahead and start presenting Lifelines for us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So my name is Stephanie Som. I'm with the Kühne Climate Center, which is a part of the Kühne Foundation. And I'm actually only your replacement today um, because uh, Sophie Punter, who is um, behind the project, uh, cannot be here. But uh, we, as the Climate Center, we work uh, with uh, Sophie Punter, and uh, we have also provided seed funding for this project, uh, which we think deserves to be taken further. So my pleasure to introduce to you today um, the Lifelines project, which is all about resilient supply chains and how we can maybe make this a case for businesses. Could you? Thank you. So we have seen this extensively over the last uh, four days, right? Um, the disruptions that are caused and also the cost of all the climate impacts that we're suffer suffering at different levels, be it in infrastructure operation, or if you're a, a community that then is, is faced with all the damage um, from these disasters, but also for small farmers, as you can see here, and if small farmers don't have a crop, they cannot go to the market, they may drop out of an international value chain. And we were thinking, Sophie was thinking, um, how can we address this uh, possibly by leveraging interest of the multiple players that are in these long supply chains? So you go to the next slide. Yeah. So and surprisingly, I mean, we, we all know that this risk is there and we have experienced disruptions and we face the cost of it. And we are aware that this is the risk that increases. So in the next 10 years, the, the environmental risks are perceived as the four most high ranking risks for, for business. And there's some, coming up some action along the supply chains, mainly when we look at scope three emissions, which is you know, becoming more, um, get, getting more attention. But then there's very little attention to how do we adapt in the first place to prevent that these supply chains disrupt along the way. And this is what we are trying to, to address with this project. To the next, please. So, Basically, we can say this is all. This is a market failure. It's a result of a market failure because those 
supply chains are very long and they're not just long, they're also very fragmented and there's so many different players and nobody is in the full control of this and nobody has the power to really manage it because there's a, a lot of intransparency also. The other thing is that we are very much concerned with the short-term priorities, so managing the daily things and not preparing for a longer, more strategic intervention to, to, to keep our supply chains alive and, and more resilient to the disruption. And then the consumers do not even know about this, right? This is not an information that you get, like you could get a, a proof that this is a bioproduct. You could not get a proof as a consumer that this is from a resilient supply chain. So even if there was agency in a con consumer interest, there's just no transparency for, for this. So how do we go about it? Lifelines stands for um, linking all the partners together to leverage their self-interest that this value chain keeps running, yeah? also under difficult uh, situations. And this, we think, works best if we just take everybody and his first tier and the one that is behind them because everybody has an interest to make work that they get their goods and they can sell on their goods. And if everybody has this interest combined along the, the value chain, then we commonly have an interest to make this whole chain uh, uh, working and, and keeping it alive. And then we all know that there's many, many operators, many different types of transport modes, links, activities along such a supply chain, so very many different stages. And we try to cover all those and bring this together, looking really from the origin to the destination, and then looking at what is the hazard that could threaten this supply chain, what is the exposure of each of the activities needed to keep this supply chain functional, what is the vulnerability and also what can be the response obviously to prepare for more resilience and integrating all this with a Paris perspective, not just adaptation but also how can we make use then of mitigating, like when we're repurposing things, how can we make this um, uh, also in, in terms of GHG emission reductions and how can we bring in finance to make this uh, feasible. The next slide, yeah, uh, can you click? There's some parts missing, yeah. So we have three steps in the project that we wanna develop. First is this assessment, like we take a supply chain that starts, let's take somewhere in Africa, food supply, and goes all the way to a big retailer in Europe. And there's many, many different steps. And so the project wants to set up a kind of a framework to assess what is the, the risk along the supply chains. The next thing is to understand, okay, what is the response measures to keep the weakest link functional? And there's different aspects to this that we can have. We need more transparency about the risks, more transparency, more information. We need also capacity along the supply chain to, to respond and to prepare. And then the last one is implementing the solutions um, together with the supply chain partners. Next one, yeah. And so for, for Lifelines, as I mentioned earlier, we are providing seed uh, funding for this to come up with a trial. Um, the idea is to bring together a community, so this is a Lifeline partnership, along a value chain. And we're looking at three uh, different value chains potentially originating in, in East Africa uh, for, for the first pilot. Then to develop this kind of assessment framework, how partners can work together, come up with assessment solutions and mechanisms, how can we implement more res uh, resilient actions along the supply chain. Ad advocacy and also awareness um, um, and capacity development is crucial. And then the, the idea is that it's in the interest of everybody, right? We bring everybody together along the same interest, again, leveraging self-interest of everybody to make this a more resilient um, supply chain from origin to destination. Okay. And so the people behind, here you can see uh, Sophie Punter. Um, so she is uh, the creator of the idea of this project and my colleague, uh, Olivia, who's based in East Africa and who's uh, taking on first research activity to um, get this started off the ground. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And if you actually want to see Sophie's presentation, it's also available online on YouTube. You simply have to go to Onktad's YouTube page and you'll have just what Stephanie explained, but with Sophie's point of view. So thank you so much. I mean, everyone has a different way of explaining things and it's always such a pleasure to have such brilliant women you know, present their innovations. So we're more than happy to have you here with us. All right. Let's continue now with uh, Taliwa Mutibura. As you might have noticed, she was called Tata by the Secretary General of Ongtad, so 
I'm guessing we, we're allowed as well to call you like that. That's perfectly fine. OK, it's your turn now, dear. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, and I will be making my quick presentation on the solar-powered locker booths meant to empower small-scale cross-border traders. So before I begin, I'll start with a quick definition of what small-scale cross-border traders are. So according to EduTrade, it's a form of trade that is unrecorded in a country's official statistics, it's like two, um, and carried out <laughs> by small businesses or individuals across borders and neighboring countries. So, so far, you'll find that on average, um, it's 70% of women who actually facilitate these transactions. So in terms of understanding visually, okay, <laughs> so this is the book definition, and then the next one will give us a, a, a visual as, uh, understanding of what exactly I'm talking about, because it's one thing to have a book definition, it's a different thing to actually see what we're talking about. So in this case, you'll find small-scale cross-border traders include women typically trading in fruits, uh, fresh and perishable produce, like in the bottom right, or like top left, ladies who probably are trading for clothing, snacks, and stuff that are meant to supply small shops and tuck shops. And then typically for those who do long distance, let's say from Zimbabwe to Tanzania, they work with buses, bottom left, where they fly in and out of the country where they go shopping for themselves, and then they leave their goods with their transporter. So they pay not only for the shipping of the goods, but for duty as well, which is basically the bus drivers trying to make negotiations on behalf of these people to get their goods into the, not only to the country where they're supposed to be, but to the literal city. So there's a long chain of untraced information, lack of accountability, and this is done simply because these small-scale traders are intimidated normally by the officials, and they find it easier to have other people who are more knowledgeable than they are getting uh, to get these processes done for them. So I'll quickly move from the visual, from the book definition, and we'll move to our imagination, hoping that one day these booths will have a visual representation as well. So imagine a metal locker measuring about one by one by one meters. And this is based on the values and volumes of the goods that they typically transact between 25 to 50 kgs for the average small-scale cross-border traders. And they would be able to typically, in, uh, they'd be able to put their goods into this locker and this locker would scan their goods for data collection as a more accurate form of data collection and as a more accurate form of just checking whether any, if anything illegal is being transported. Because another main thing that results in these people having to behave more duty is that officials will say, uh, what you're trying to import is illegal, so if you want to bring that in, pay a higher fee. Which, if it's illegal, ideally they're not even supposed to bring it in. But because these traders don't know what they don't know, they're being taken advantage of. So that's the physical aspect of the locker. On the side of the locker, there would be a simple screen Typical ATM style, or if you uh, checked into Barbados airport, airport with the self-service, something like that where they will be able to by themselves state the information, input the invoice value, and the goods that they're importing into the country. And for more accessibility, because language barriers and literacy tend to be huge barriers to facilitate these transactions, I was suggesting that we also have images and a simple drop-down menu so that an algorithm can be input, a simple one again, to help calculate duty accurately so that by the time that these traders come through, there's a promise of predictability, a major barrier, a major hurdle for these particularly ladies because they don't know what the day looks like. Towards festive season, probably they'll typically pay more. Towards end of day, they probably typically pay more. And because all these processes are being done by a system, we're removing the number of officials who have to participate, and I hopefully would also be able to have, instead of cards, um, for bank cards for payments, would also be able to have mobile wallets as a product offering, because in African markets you'll find that they have a huge penetration, and in terms of connectivity, because they don't require um, internet connection, and mobile wallet providers, their main targets are rural areas, which is where most of our African borders are based. In terms of network provision, they would be able to facilitate to make sure that these transactions are a bit more seamless. The other aspect of this locker is solar powered. So in many cases, our national grids are already burdened. So solar power is to simply make sure to guarantee the efficiency of this system. And the second aspect is a move, an intentional move towards more um, sustainable practices in terms of SDG 9 and 11, which promote sustainable communities and innovations. 
So those are the main aspects. And then as far as creating the locker in itself is concerned, there has been a growing trend, particularly in Zim, where people are importing ex-Japanese vehicles, which typically have a shorter lifespan than the average vehicle. So you'll find we've got a lot of dump sites where these vehicles are just laying there. And typically, because their bodies are made to withstand tough external conditions, you'll find that they can be remolded as a way of reducing carbon emissions that would have been, um, that would have come in the form of either transporting more metal sheets from wherever they come from or creating brand new ones. So we're just creating the full circle of encouraging and empowering communities to um, recycle and it empowers the locals because I think this can be done by panel beaters who have exposure to these bodies. So that's this locker booth in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm a terrible moderator because although I had said that it was five minutes per, present, per, per presentation, I just think that everything is so interesting. I cannot find myself to cut them, so please bear with me. Uh, <laughs> goodness gracious. Okay, let's continue now with the last panelist, oh, well, our, our last finalist that is present here today because we had a couple more. Once again, if you want to see their bios, they're available on our UNCTAD website. And let's finish this off with Cristina Martin who is going to, he, she's a CEO of Usyncro, and she will present her innovation. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you, Maria. And first of all, thank you to uh, all of you for building uh, this innovation challenge and making possible to do this presentation and to make visibility about uh, our project. So I'm Cristina Martin. I'm CEO and co-founder of Usyncro. Usyncro is a cloud platform that synchronizes all the stakeholders in supply chain. Uh, but not only the, the private ones, like for example, importers, exporters, forwarders, customs brokers, warehouse, but also the public ones, like customs authorities, sanitary authorities, because the main problem, and please the uh, next slide, the, the main problem is that uh, there are many. It's a super fragmented process, and uh, this process uh, is a nightmare, no? It's paper-based with tons of emails, the systems are disconnected, United Nations uh, has a, an inform that estimates that the 20% of the transport cost is due to this fragmented process. So next, we uh, built a solution, a cloud solution, a SaaS, in order to synchronize all the stakeholders in a super easy way. But the, the challenge is to be neutral. We do not force nobody to share any data, to invite uh, a specific ocean company or a specific role. So everybody has the power to decide which data to share and with whom in any moment. And also we are interoperable with the actual system. So uh, some of the KPIs is reducing cost, reducing the time spent per transaction, and also reduce the uh, amount of paper that we are using. So next, please. Even the regulation is forcing us to be digital the SEBAM, the, the electronic documents. So we need to have tools that make the life easy to the customers. Next, please. So using blockchain and artificial intelligence, we can do that. And not because they are trendy technologies and everybody is talking about them, it's just because of the capabilities. Blockchain gives tra traceability, security, automatization, and transparency. And with artificial intelligence, we can do several things. I'm going to put some examples. Next, please. For example, we can issue electronic documents by following fiat rules, for example, we can make the interoperability possible. We have done this with CargoX, that is the platform that supports the Egypt uh, country in order to enter goods uh, by sea. Next, please. We have developed uh, uh, goods control in inside infrastructures, for example, for perishables. Next, please. We have developed an artificial intelligence algorithm to suggest statistic codes for customs clearance. Uh, Next, please. Or even the FBL, in which not only we issue the electronic BL, but also we can double check the digital identity that builds this document, okay? So next, and uh, the interoperability. Next, please. Uh, the, these kind of tools, and, and we are uh, seeing and hearing uh, all the panelists over here, they are building single windows, they are building uh, poor community systems, but all those initiatives are like silos. 
So somebody need to interoperate in between all those systems because if not, we will have a huge amount of systems that are already disconnected. They are digital, but are disconnected, no? So next, please. So we have put on the table the digital corridor. A digital corridor is a shipment in which all the parties are connected. Next, please. So by building digital corridors, we connect private parts, public parts, and we build a network in between the different regions and, country, and countries to streamline the flow of goods. Building digital, yes, next please, Maria. So, <laughs> so building circular relationships and sharing data in real time, next please. So we have built, for example, humanitarian digital corridor uh, with Turkey, with the earthquake. We were, uh, it was possible to connect authorities, the embassy, Turkish airlines, all the stakeholders that taking care about the goods in order to reach in record time uh, to destination. The earthquake was on Sunday and on Monday we have uh, the digital corridor already built. Next, please. With pharma products also within Peru. Next, please. <laughs> and uh, well, it, it, we, we are super, uh, super committed with the ODS. So all this technology we try to uh, be more digital, be more sustainable and also includes all the collectives and uh, even women in, in debt. Next, please. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we realized two things during this short period. These ladies are amazing, and I cannot put the slides on time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anywho, can I please have another round of applause for these fantastic <laughs> ladies here with me? Thank you so much. So initially we were supposed to have a second question regarding what were the challenges that each one of these uh, proposals had when trying to implement or when basically trying to create this uh, innovation. But I think that it's best if we start already the conversation with our experts here present because I think that there's a lot to be said. So is anyone willing, is any, does anyone volunteer to start this discussion off to say, I don't know, which proposal you'd like to discuss on first? I am. All ears. <laughs> uh, I can propose if you want to. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Pamela okay, goes first. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you so much, Maria. Uh, you are a great moderator. <laughs> and, and I really want, would like to thank to all the, the finalists and the winners also. But all our winners. Uh, it was really very difficult. I was part of the jury. And let me tell you that we received 79, 78, seven proposals. And it was really very hard to cutting out to the finalists and then having the, the winners. So uh, so congratulations, all the winners. And what I wanted to say is from the perspective of trade facilitation, maybe I would like to, to comment uh, Tadi, oh, Tata uh, proposal. And yeah, first, I would like to mention that three dimensions that why we love your proposal. is First is the human aspect, because I had the chance, and I am really very lucky, that I have worked with cross-border traders, small cross-border cross traders in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, and the, 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 the challenge that they face are the same. If they go through the, and they pass the border, it doesn't matter how they look or what they take, they are always inspected, always, always. And, and they, I have talked to many of them, and they have told me that it's, sometimes it's really unfair, and the way that they inspected them. So this, uh, and in not only that part, uh, the harassment that these women face, unfortunately, at the borders, but also that many of them uh, are asked for uh, money. I mean, yeah, bri bribes. And, uh, and another also very important is that all these women, they, many of them, uh, of them are single mothers. Families depend on them. Uh, and uh, due to this, they, are, they, don't, they don't trade cross borders, so they are losing some revenues. So all these human aspects that can be solved with such a simple idea, really. It's like put a locker where you can put the things so they, they, they don't have to pass these inspections physically but they do it through a locker, so it can change life, families. 
And it comes to my second aspect, is the economic aspect, that we love it, because we know that many of these uh, small traders are the head of one thing, uh, uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises, micro enterprises. So it has a, a snowball effect, no? If they trade more, so one day they will become bigger and it will impact in society, uh, education, you, you know, investing in women has a snowball effect. Then some challenges that I see in the, in the, because I also need to talk about what are the challenges. So first is that to find the right technology for your proposal. Uh, but now, here, there are many innovators, so I, I, I am sure that we can, we, can, we can find what is the right technology. Then also, we will need to work more in, on standards. So because this idea of scanning the, the good will have all the benefit if that can be exchanged, the data that they are going to collect in these lockers with other countries. So, standards, uh, harmonization, that will be very important, and also border agency cooperation. So that means that all the agencies will need to really look at what will be the information that the data that they are getting from these scanners and from these uh, lockers, and uh, share that information and uh, and share that information not, uh, not only among themselves at the national level, but cross-border with the other agencies. And very important, uh, all, and was mentioned in many of the sessions, having single windows is, is, is key, this, having technology in place. Uh, the second kind of challenge, and I, I will be very short here, is infrastructure. Uh, we know that at the borders, and it's the same situation in, in, in many countries, even if they are at a certain level of development, but usually the, po the border poles are, are, are they, they don't have sometimes electricity, not even toilets. So, so it, yeah, for women, it's quite quite complicated. So ha be sure that you have the infrastructure, the bandwidth, internet, electricity, and all the facilities uh, is also another challenge. Uh, but uh, well, this is the first step, and I would like really to congratulate again uh, Tata for for this for this great proposal. So thank you so much. Okay, so. One of, our sp one of our experts has spoken. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. So who can I call on next? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for that mic. <laughs> um, because I think anything that creates um, visibility, I think that that's very important, right? And because it, in this case, it creates self-sufficiency, and I think that is super important. So I think that's that's really, really great. And it seems like you've well thought out how this is going to work, so I think that's great. Um, and I think, Pamela, you mentioned a good point about the, you know, the, the single windows, because I remember um, just that stat about poor community systems that ports were supposed to have in place, I think, in 2019 and in 2021. I think only a third had that in place, so there is always that delay of you know getting getting things done. And now we have that regulation that they are supposed to have the single windows in place. And I'm looking forward to getting you know uh, data on how that implementation is going, uh, maybe in in a couple of years. So I think, and that kind of leads, uh, I think, also into Christina into your kind of plan that you have, right? So obviously, anything that again like creates um, possibilities to to digitize um, is, is very much welcomed and, and needed. Um, but how, you know, how to, how to get people to actually, to actually do that, right? And like, what's the, what's the, the, the incentive um, that, and, and also getting, you know, we, you know, we talk about supply chain, which means that there are so many, uh, you know, players involved, getting people to realize that other people depend on this. So, you know, in order to get this this underway and say, you know, we want more transparency, then we need those we need those systems in place. So hopefully we have I don't know, do we have yet someone <laughs> in the room who's who can make things happen? That would be good. Um but yeah, obviously I think all of you very, very bright ideas that, that are all very much needed and, and welcomed. Um I think I'll I'll stop here. I don't know, do you wanna Miranda, do you wanna give uh, thanks. I think uh, three uh, great ideas and three good uh, business cases. But actually, and if, if we really want to, I mean, uh, implement actually, or you know, uh, even uh, 
put that into reality. I think, of course, actually, I'll pick up your one first uh, with regard to the uh, you know the solar powered lockers. I think the one of the challenges, actually, probably, or oh, even things that you can consider is, you know, how actually even when let's say we have a locker, when you put thing, goods into a locker, actually, how how the locker scans different types of goods, different. I mean, because we are talking about the customs, especially on the HS codes, like you know, say how actually the uh, different type of type of goods based on different types of harmonized codes that the, you know that the system that you are planning to develop and how it's going to actually pick up those and how the because we are talking about ordinary uh, you know it's, let's say I mean these ladies actually of course doesn't have much of a knowledge of you know the harmonized codes scanning and things like that but who's going to do that and and how we actually categorize these goods and then what is the system that you'll be you know using to transmit that information to the customs or the whatever the board, uh, you know, security or whoever is going to charge them. Probably that's something, you know, from my point of view, uh, from a technology aspect that probably, you know, it's good to look at at this stage and see, of course, the solar power is something that you can easily like set up, uh, you know, device to, you know, like it's open and close, you know, the, the lockers, but the most advanced technology that we have to use is the scanning. But how do you use actual scanning? Of course, whether you are using uh, some sort of uh, RFID technology to identify the goods and categorize goods based on certain codes or a device that can scan multiple, you know, commodities. And then it's quite a bit of a complex thing that, you know, if you really uh, think about, but of course there are technology available now, but the, but the question is the cost of technology for, for a small, I mean, you know, a user. So that's something that probably you can think of. And I, li I like the idea of it, especially like uh, there are three different ty type of things I, um, I've been contemplating when it comes to these business cases. One is about the, uh, probably I think all of us might have heard, the collaborative consumption. So it's also basically the collaborative commerce in supply chain. Because we also, what we try to do is, we try to collaborate actually, let's say in a one, uh, some of these lockers can cannot be owned by somebody, but can be used by multiple users. So it's basically uh, promoting the collaborative commerce, actually, in supply chain efficiency. That's the one thing that I would like to actually highlight. And the second project, of course, um, the ICT, which is, again, actually, you know, uh, how, how the innovation, the di digital innovation can uh, basically, you know, uh, you know be harmonized. Uh, the, and also, actually, the, the, co the concept of aggregation. Uh, and the impact of aggregation in the supply chain efficiency, because we always look at you know a defrag fragmented markets, the fragmented supply chain. So I, I think they, like what we try to achieve in your uh, you know the business case is basically how we could aggregate, and then you, you know and, and improve the supply chain efficiency, which is a great concept. And then of course we really put that into uh, action. And uh, I was basically like in your case I was looking at the, the concept of, you know, the 5G technology in the ports and the port efficiency is concerned. And it's, which is, again, a great uh, way of, you know, uh, improving the, the, the port efficiency. So, uh, of course, I was like, I mean, looking at the areas, how we, how we are going to implement the technology in the port setup, whether it's going to be container tracking, uh, container, I mean, like, say, the pricing, especially uh, terminal pricing, because one of the technology, like you know, right, right now, is you know, still missing actually for most of the customers, uh, especially like in, in in the port setup, is uh, the RFID tagging of containers to identify the the container uh, search, container pricing, and as well as the revenue collection for the ports. Because this is something like you might ha have to have multiple uh, connections in the port. Maybe the five G is the technology, you know, the the future technology going going into the ports tracking containers through uh, active or passive RFID technology. So this also includes gate in, gate out procedures uh, and the container movements inside the port, uh, revenue calculations and revenue generation as well. So I think three get great ideas actually I would like, I mean, the, the concepts probably uh, I think uh, I would like to emphasize it. One is the, uh, the, the collaborative commerce actually for supply, sh supply chain efficiency and as well as aggregation uh, in, in a more fragmented market. So we're always looking at, you know, fragmentation actually in, 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 the, in the supply chain efficiency, but the aggregation is the key uh, and, and it's a way forward for a better efficiency and, and 
uh, you know, and as well as, I mean, uh, reaching the benefit, you know, to a greater number of people as well. So that's my actual comment on the three, uh, the, the, ca the business cases. Yeah. <laughs> And say hello from Geneva, from our fantastic communications expert who just sent me a message, is the live stream over. Uh, yeah, no, I think the live stream is fine. I will we'll figure out what's, what's happening with that anyways. I think, should we open the floor for all of our wonderful participants here? What do you think, Ines? Yeah, I, can I just uh, quickly add something maybe for, for Millie? Um, and um, that's so when you talk about establishing your hydrogen um, kind of trade, so you will send hydrogen around as ammonia, right? Uh, or for, like, that's that, for the first that, that is to be debated, and we're waiting for the innovation to leapfrog. Yeah. Uh, but that is the current availability. And then I think that, because I think that's probably, and then the obviously most efficient way to do it. And then right. uh, my follow-up question would be, do you have at the port of um, destination or wherever hub of uh, destination where it's going, do you have like s agriculture that's around that that will use the ammonia? Like is there a use case for the ammonia? I think that's something to think about when yes. we talk about a hydrogen kind of networks. Yeah, absolutely. We're in the Pacific region. The other islands, we can definitely offload from the other islands. Uh, but uh, there's Australia. Uh, that's very heavily agriculture in New Zealand as well. And we have uh, a PACER plus regional uh, trade agreement uh, that I believe will benefit everybody in the region with it. Excellent. Okay, I think we should maybe concentrate on lifelines now. <laughs> and then, and, oh. I have a question for my Oh, fantastic, see, everyone's aligned. Great, Namrata. <laughs> yeah, aligned. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, I was just wondering, your presentation sounds really fantastic and you're like, we'll get everybody to do it and it's a win, win, win. And we think like that all the time in the supply chain and it is not the truth. Um, most people are like, commerce is at the expense of human capital, is at the expense of like open trading, which is actually going to be affecting competitive advantage, blah, 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 blah. I don't have to tell you all of that. How? How are you doing this? Well, how, how do we hope to do this, right? Yeah. So when I, when I said um, leveraging self-interest, I think this is one of the key pieces. Transparency is another key piece, and that people get a kickback from the fact that they share transparency and care for their neighbor. So the thinking is really, you know, oftentimes we look at the supply chain and we try to ha have interventions, but they are not really linked to people's interest. And your interest, you're a crop producer, one, of thousands and you want to sell your stuff. So you have an interest to serve your clients reliably and you need maybe a road or a storage that is you know, keeping alive. The client also has this one interest to buy from this smaller one. Yeah? The one that is 10, feet, uh, 10 steps down the line doesn't really care because they didn't, don't even know this. But if you really try to create this awareness between the ones, because for those one client, if one of his supplier drops out, it's quite a shock for the small one. Yeah? So we're trying to create this transparency and awareness at each step. So if each one takes care of his neighbor, kind of carrying responsibility and transparency forward, that this could make clear that it's for the better for all of them. Because nobody wants to, in the end, a ship not leaving because there's not enough supply to leave. And then the huge food processor in Switzerland, maybe, <laughs> does not get a shipment because something happened further down where he could not even know it would happen. Be hopeful. <laughs> We're hopeful. That's a lovely message. <laughs> Let's continue. Go ahead, uh, good evening, ladies. Wonderful presentations. Um, very, very impressive. And Miss Mutibura, uh, did I pronounce it correctly? I'm extremely impressed with yours since I'm the product of, well, one of the ladies that helped to raise me was a cross-border trader. And I understand the type of dynamics that she had to deal with. So what you're coming up with is fantastic for me. But I have a query, a question, comment about change, um, both from Ms. Ogden and Martin. The concept of replacing people's norm generally has a pushback. And both of you are coming up with systems that will drastically change people's lives 
people's way of operating, even though there may be savings, and people tend to incrementally accept change when what you're coming up with is a drastic change that requires literally people to stop doing something today and start doing something tomorrow if it's going to be implemented well. How is that factoring into your proposals and what can be done to set the stage for that type of pushback so that implementation, when we get to that stage, is something that is smoother uh, rather than fraught with the type of pushback that could cause that type of change to fail. Thank you for that question. Um, I don't know if I'm a bit too hopeful for saying this, but I had the privilege of actually meeting, because in terms of change, my biggest fear was what the Zimbabwe Revenue Authorities from that aspect, that's the side I was most worried about. But I had the advantage of meeting one of them, there's actually one here today, and he said he's willing to have a conversation. So, so far from that aspect, I think if we have Zimra on board, and it comes from that aspect of authority, because I feel like it's mainly that branch that's benefiting through the um, illegal practices in a way. If we can get that branch specifically on board, I think we have a better chance of um, integrating this much more smoothly. And then, yeah, I think, I hope that's an answer to your question. <laughs> I'm just just thinking the thought processes that could, could, could carry this project forward. True. Well, in, in our case, uh, we have done it in, in four ways. So first of all, we realized that people is key. Collaboration is key, but people is key because they need to accept this change. And the first step uh, when we talk about the project and talk about blockchain and talk about artificial intelligence, people is frightened because most of the times they are not technological. They do not understand the technology and have the fear to show everybody that they do not understand the technology. So for that, we have built a sandbox in which they can train and they can uh, see by their own eyes that they can use blockchain and artificial intelligence if they have the skills of sending an email. This is the first step, to show everybody that they can, even if they are not technological, to skip this frighten. The second part is that nobody is going to use technology just because it's trendy. They are going to use technology because uh, they uh, efficient process, they make more business and go directly to the PNL. If not, nobody is going to spend any second in, in testing another technology. Uh, the third part is that the platform is completely dynamic. We do not uh, need everybody to be in because if not, it will be impossible. So even if only one of the stakeholders use the system, they improve their actual process because they avoid emails or whatever. And the fourth one, and, and it's, it's almost key, is that we are in the right forum. Associations are key. All the visibility, all the, um, let's say, stakeholders that are now here in this room that are part of the process are listening for new way of doing things. So the visibility that we have now help us to tell you all that, uh, please try. Try and, and see if this is efficient for you, if this is worthy for you, if you make a business with that. And if it is a win-win for you, okay, let's go. Okay, great. Millie? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm having been through a four category five cyclone, and also speaking five languages, I just have to read this to you. So because it's hard to uh, uh, vocalize uh, what I have to say. So I wish to highlight the paramount importance of the green digital corridor smart port for Vanuatu. In the face of our existential threat from extreme weather, this innovation is not just a necessity, but a beacon of resilience and progress for our blue Pacific region. So for this particular uh, project that I'm putting forth before you, it is just to pilot in Vanuatu. 
And for us, it is not an option, but we have to absolutely implement this. The 5G is also a uh, platform for cybersecurity, and we have been hacked uh, a couple years ago, and that has uh, brought our economy to a halt. Um, so I believe the way to go about it, the thinking process, is uh, um, to explain the scope to our stakeholders and to have our government have the narrative to really, we need to implement AI, we need to implement robotics, because our small population in Vanuatu cannot warrant and manage all the volume and traffic. And so once I believe we have the education, uh, we will be more apt to um, sign in. But we also need to lean on technology. A lot of the data implementation could actually be automated via IoT, information of um, um, the Internet of Things. And so uh, we can actually make it user friendly so that way we don't put the burden on the end user as well. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. And we have a gentleman that has a question over here. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Denzel Phillips, and I'm a freelance consultant. I've had the privilege of living in an African village for three years, some years ago, and every single woman in that village left to do cross-border trading in the dry season. And they came back, and I got to know many of these women because I was doing some research over three years. All of them faced impossible and very difficult situations with cross-border. Sexual exploitation, they are all illiterate, and people took their money, and it was a very dangerous thing they were doing. I've also had the privilege of recently working in a thing called the Global Frankincense Alliance, where thousands of women are involved all over Somalia, Ethiopia, and some of the poorest countries in the world. And again, the same thing, male exploitation and cross-border hassling is a major, major factor. And they are frightened to talk about this. They are frightened to record. So anything that you do that is going to put them into the limelight is going to cause not only problems in their home, because maybe they are called, they look like single women, but they're not. They're women who have got families, but they go away in the dry season. And secondly, I think the whole issue about blockchain analysis is very important. It is the way forward. And we are working on a project with a big, I can't give the name, a cosmetic company in England to do blockchain analysis for a very difficult project like Frankincense. It can be done. We can have solutions. Thank you so much, sir. Do we have anyone else would like to comment our, on our wonderful proposals? Everyone is very tired, I see. Okay, Namrata. <laughs> we are very happy that you're full of energy. It's fantastic. Much appreciated. I had some cake. It was amazing. Um, I, I just, I was really interested by the fact that you talked about the fact that leapfrogging to 5G was much more efficient than remaining with 4G. Uh, and I think that actually, you know, being willing to make that opens the door to, I mean, at least commercially, a lot of resistance from people who are like, oh, then we're looking at stranded assets super fast with like really quick, quicker cycles of stranded assets, uh, which I think speaks to the change you were talking about, which is people are going to be like, oh, I, I just invested in all of this 4G stuff and now, now you're talking about blah and, you know, it's definitely subsidized. But how are you prepared, and I, and I think this would actually apply to anybody working in the tech sector, how are you bracing people for the fact that tech is changing so fast that investing in it is incredibly risky? Like you can't not do it, but also if you do it, maybe you, you're gambling, basically. We're using an open RAN system. So at a policy level, uh, people have asked for flexibility and so you could be modular in terms of our progress. Um, I believe it is really fast. Because of that, we should actually take advantage of it because technology is actually perishable as well. So uh, we should not be, uh, we should embrace it and we should uh, not be afraid to fail, have the technology fail as well, because as soon as that fails, there's another one that's ready for you uh, to implement next so, and probably cheaper and five times faster. But I do have to address that there is a policy issue. 
Um, and so that's why this is disruptive, is because uh, the port authorities have to make that decision. The government has to make that decision to, for, to make an exceptional license for the technology to be, to be utilized because the billion dollar has been sent, uh, spent on these uh, LEO satellites, and there are more coming. The Starlink is not the only one currently, but it is good for a long time, so this project is profitable. Thank you so much, Millie. And again, we apologies for my wonderful screen. You might have noticed that technology really is perishable <laughs> because I did put myself on Do Not Disturb. <laughs> Ladies, would you like to comment as well on this question? Thank you. The, we have only one version of the platform so that we evolve the product and everybody has the last version. That's why we are sure that uh, we evolve with the technology and, and we uh, put more functionalities and more capabilities in the platform and everybody has the same access to the same version. That's uh, the, the solution that we have decided to implement. Excellent, and Stephanie? Would you like to add something else to, I don't know, some final words because as time is running out and I want to at least keep that okay in this panel. <laughs> Stephanie, please go ahead. I think um, one of the commonalities we all have is creating this transparency and a joint channel to transmit this information, right? This is kind of resonating in all our action and I think this is maybe also the biggest obstacle that this transparency is lacking amongst actors. And if we can create this and make people understand that they have something back from their investment in sharing information, that could be one strong lever, I believe, to make people act and uh, create more resilient uh, supply chains. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So at the very start of this presentation, we said that we would be basically maybe brainstorming on what would be the following Global Supply Chain Forum Innovation Challenge 2026 topic. Does anyone have in mind a topic that they think would be interesting? Do you have some type of inkling of what will be an important issue in supply chains in 2026? Just to have an idea. It's also, it would also help us a lot. <laughs> Oh, so I see we have one wonderful person participant in, on the third row, if I can count. I can still count. No, it's fourth row. Fourth row. I cannot count either. Great. <laughs> it's okay. The first row doesn't matter. <laughs> um, thank, you. thank you again to our lovely panelists and moderator, Maria. Um, for me, I think the biggest issue is um, labor in supply chains. Many of our supply chains are built on the backs of exploitative labor. Um, the raw materials is usually the first starting point of the supply chain. Um, and it's very, it's, it's very um, prevalent in supply chains involving low value commodities such as agriculture and minerals. And we've seen some attempts to improve the conditions of the workers at the bottom of the supply chain such as fair trade, uh, initiatives. We've also seen a lot of consumer activism. However, these efforts have not been very perm have not led to permanent effects. So I think going forward, we really need to study how can we have uh, permanently improve the conditions of the people at the bottom of the supply chain, and even those that are excluded from the supply chain and would like to enter. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if anyone else has any ideas, please feel, oh, we still have ideas, great. I know that it's the last panel of the day. Can you believe that we're almost done with the second day of parallel Gustavo sessions? Believes Gustavo believes it, yes. I'll, t I'll let no. him know that that message was <laughs> visible to everyone. He will be very happy to hear. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mary. Actually, no, if I can give you one insight uh, into the next you know, the innovation challenge that you'll be having in, in, in two years of time. It's about a circular supply chain. Because like what, when you, one, of the, one of the greatest actual challenges right now we face is the, you know, the sheer amount of actual waste generated through the supply chain. I mean, we talk about the efficiency, but we hardly, hardly actually forget, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the components that we can always reduce, reuse, and, and, you know, in terms of actually supply chain efficiency. And so if we can look at, you know, the models of uh, circular supply chain, and uh, that'll be something actually probably uh, really good at looking 
and uh, that also contributes so to the climate challenge as well. And we have one more. Great. And then I promise you'll be free to go. <laughs> I know you want to enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <coughs> Please go ahead, sir. Okay, it's difficult because every industry has their own challenges. But in general, uh, I, I mean that collaboration and digitalization continue being the, the, the great challenge. And particularly in this island, the SEEDS Islands, demand collaboration start with demand consolidation. While a provider receive 20 different order with 20 different condition will be very difficult to supply the islands. The first collaboration step for this island is demand consolidation. It's my idea. Thanks. And with those words, <laughs> and there's one more. Okay, I will. Apologies. If you hate me, hate me. <laughs> Please go ahead, sir. <laughs> Could you at the, back. at the very back, yeah. And I will not count because I know I'll get it wrong. Awesome. So just in terms of what we could be looking at in two years and literally keeping the topic on the innovation from a technology point of view, one of the fears I see is the increased disparity between those who have advanced in supply chain technically and those who would not be able to catch up in two years for various reasons, whether economic, geopolitical situations, whatnot. And then the supply chain trying to favor a lot more, as we heard from our prime minister earlier when we started, that your ships won't come to the ports, ports are not ready for it, basic infrastructure is not there. And I mean, I'm actually very impressed with your presentation about the, the 5G and all of that stuff. And that's great that your country is investing in it and, and they, they want it and it's needed. But that same driving force across the globe on all the, I'm coming from UN, all our 192 member states, that they all can afford it and be ready to accept it so that all those population can actually benefit from it. Worry is that there are countries who would run way faster, way ahead, and the supply chain would be more focused around there because it's automated, it's important, and then there are those who would still be struggling to catch up. And that, I think, is just going to increase the gap over the next two years. So something needed to look into. Don't have a solution, though. Thank you so much. So that will probably be discussed during the, su the Innovation Challenge in 2026. No, no issue. So without further ado, can we please give a big round of applause for all this fantastic panel. And I officially call the session to a close. You're all free to go, lovely people. Thank you so much for joining us.